think if you'd all noticed earlier, and you would have to have been asleep not to, uh, Sasquatch might be in the building today. <laughs> this next speaker, I believe, is going to shed a little light on that for us. He's, uh, he's from right here in Conway, Arkansas, and his uh, speech is entitled Crypto Arkansas, Musings on Monsters in Our Midst. Everybody, let's give a welcome to Mark Spitzer. Is that working back there? Yep. Thank you, everybody. I'm, I'm really um, honored to be asked to talk today about my, my book, Crypto Arkansas. Um, so uh, let's just get, get into it here. Um, just to let you know where I'm coming from, um, most of my work, I'm a, I'm a creative writing professor at the University of Central Arkansas, and um, my big research is Alligator Gar. Um, I just had my second Alligator Gar, Gar book come out. These are you know primitive fish here in uh, in the South. Uh, they can get you know 200, 300 pounds, um, 10, 11 feet long. Uh, the Alligator Gar. Um, so I've always had a fascination with monsters. I saw this picture in a book when I was six years old and uh, it changed my life. It's the alligator guards become my identity because I saw this picture. Um, and this picture comes right here from Arkansas. I think that's the intersection of the Cache and the White River when that was caught uh, back in the 50s or something like that. Oops, wrong way. Uh, this is a picture I, I drew when I was like in fourth grade or something. Um, <laughs> I've, like many of you here, I've always had the boyish obsession with monsters, um, and you know it's, it's easy to write it off as that. It's just an obsession with monsters, but um, there's something deeper going on with monsters. It's you know basically um, there, there's a and dream worldish creative application that we have all historically shared in order to make sense of what we can't explain on our communal psychology. Um, I mean, all cultures think about monsters, basically. Uh, monster, monster making is something that we do uh, because it's what we want to muse on uh, or have amuse us. The word muse uh, is what it's about the word inspiration. Um, when we talk about muses, we're talking about inspirations for why we make art and why we test the imagination. Case in point, uh, the concept of wild people. Um, this is something that I started studying when I was a college student at the University of Minnesota uh, about 30 years ago. Um, I got involved in the, a formal study of this Renaissance medieval icon called the Wild Man um, and the role of this icon in art history and literature as a representation of our connection with the natural world in contrast to a rapidly developing civilization. Ever since the Wild Man character Enkidu in the Gilgamesh epic, a 4,000 year old story that's considered the first work of literature, the missing link idea of a hairy, half-human, half-monster has been popping up in every culture of the world. From the leafy Jack of the Greens and Green Man characters of Nordic barbarian tribes to mythologies of ancient Asian and African populations, our artists and imaginers have been personifying the idea of unkempt pagan monster men running shaggily through the woods, fighting knights with clubs and abducting maidens. Uh, so under the direction of an actual Dr. Savage, I went through a million microfish photos in this German um, file called the Marburger Index. Uh, and I wrote a 400-page four, senior thesis, and I got a grant to go run around Europe with a photographer searching for and documenting more wild people images in illuminated manuscripts medieval and renaissance architecture, church pews, to tombstones, etc. And in searching through archives and museums from Dublin to Budapest, I learned a lot about the idea of the grotesque. And I learned a lot about the wild nature of our psyches and why we invent scapegoats 
to account for what we can't fathom in our own nature. It's been a lifelong study, which I now apply to the senseless demonization of fish that have been stigmatized because of the scary way they look and the consequences of such ignorance. The classic clash between the environment and an ever-industrializing society makes its way into the environmental courses I teach at UCA as well. So naturally, when I moved to Arkansas for my professor job, I began to hear all these colorful stories that are so much a part of the culture and folklore of the oral and written traditions in the state. Stories about wampus cats and water monsters and elaborate hybrids running around in Nimdar Hills and these here swamps passed down for generations and recorded by crypto historians like Vance Randolph and Jimmy Driftwood. I, I, I saw these stories and I was hooked. There was no way I couldn't not muse on or study such stuff in my midst and write this book. Um, the, the cover of the book, this image is uh, of what's uh, an Arkansas monster that's been called the Gaurau, or as others have pronounced it, the Guru. I really don't know the proper way to pronounce it, but I'm gonna say Gaurau. Um, this, this picture comes from, uh, was manipulated from a photo, an illustration of a photo, something like that, that appeared in 1897 uh, copy uh, issue of the Arkansas Gazette. Uh, so basically what I did was I took the obscure exper experimental postmodern form of investigative poetics, which was developed by American poet Ed Sanders in the late 20th century. And I incorporated data, dates, stats, images, blurbs, and other flashes from our socio-historical political consciousness. And I presented my biased but objective findings through free verse. That's just what I wanted to do. I wanted to play with a playful subject matter. And poetry afforded me that self-indulgent sense of, sense of humor luxury, which the seriousness of prose can't approach with as much liberating whimsy as poetry can, because poetry allows for poetic license, and prose, not so much. So here's an example of the writing style. Mythology of the terrible green Garau, Garau. Throughout the Ozarks, there are tales of cavern-dwelling lizards reaching lengths of 20 feet, carrying their young marsupially, and laying eggs the size of kegs while terrorizing communities. Back in 1897, Little Rock businessman Bill Miller formed a posse in Searcy County to catch a pesky reptile responsible for slaughtering hogs, dogs, cats, and cattle. On the outskirts of Blanco near Calf Creek Township, following tracks with Winchesters, they discovered a cave filled with grinning skulls, and then it erupted from the river. A huge body of a sickly green hue, these are quotes, with two enormous tusks, webbed feet complete with claws, enormous scales, spine stegosaurusly, and a sharp bone sickling forth from its tail. Garau, garau, roared the horrible green garau of the goofus family <laughs> as it stomped waddled toward the men, shaking the terrain like a stern-wheeled steamer, or in other accounts, the San Francisco earthquake. <clears throat> Miller took a photograph, which was published as an illustration by Elmer Burris and written up by Elbert Smithy in the Arkansas Gazette, recalling how the farmers fired on its ponderous man-shaped head, and how it lashed its dragon tail slicing down trees, plus the leg right off a poor fellow named Tom Brennan. Then hitting the monster with another volley, they sprang upon the beast and chopped it into chunks. Miller proclaimed it a pachyderm hybrid, fused with a hyendia and rhinosauritati, dating back to the Miocene, so sent its skin and skeleton onto the Smithsonian. But guess what? It never arrived. <laughs> Shades of Vance Randolph's folklore of the Missourian, who captured a gaurau by enticing it to eat a wagon load of dried apples, which caused it to swell up in its burrow. The Missourian pitched a tent over it and charged 25 cents admission. But before the paid up patrons could enter, 
A shredded showman staggered out, bleeding and screaming, the Gauro rock out, run for your lives. <laughs> then rattle up chains and banging pans, women screaming, tents collapsing, and the crowd took off and nobody got their money back. <laughs> Shades also of the Devil's Hole, near the village of Sylph in Boone County, where landowner E.J. Rhodes, no date known, lowered himself into a fissure, dropped 200 feet toward a commotion, but refused to spelunk any further. Cleo Harper and co. of Little Rock, though, picked up where Rhodes left off, circa 1924. Lowering a flat iron into the hissing hole, something happened at 200 feet. They pulled up the rope, the handle was bent. So they lowered a stone and something snapped, severing the line. They tried it again, same thing, bite marks discernible. So I went to the story Devil's Hole, clearly marked on Google Earth, got onto the farmer's land and found the sinkhole, stuffed with the stuff of dumps, ball tires, window screens, exercise bikes, washing machines, kitchen sinks, brush cuttings, and a bright pink bowling ball. In other words, a giant pile of irrefutable, but colorful, Arkansas garbage. <laughs> Um, this piece is followed in the book by another piece called the Gaudendum, which traces the linguistic evolution of the word Gaurau through American history um, and makes a case for it being a phonic distortion. Because that's what all these stories really are, I think, distortions of what our imaginations create to make sense of mysteries. Uh, take the Lake Conway monster, for example, which my investigation revealed to me more than just an embodiment of a general fear of the other. What I found was a much more culturally rich, yet unfortunately xenophobic, paranoia that's consistent with our history of race relations in the southern states. So I'll read that poem. Lake Conway monster myth, the evolution of. Deep in murk of Tupelo, cypress knees and gator weed, muck some mucus froggy beast, twisting up a monkey face. The swampy shores of Lake Conway have been dripping with this mystery for more than half a century. Even before 48, when the Game and Fish Commission flooded the mosquito-infested Kalarm bottoms, farmers had reported a man-sized, hunchbacked thing, known as the Thing, glucking through the water snakes. The hysteria broke in 52 when George Dillon of Mayflower hauled a mutant hellbender up. On April 11, 1953, the log cabin Democrat reported it to be 80 pounds of gunked in goo, adding, the story was amplified as it left Faulkner County. Some even branded it as a hoax to promote the lake. It was com commonly referred to as the Lake Conway monster story which got told and retold till the image that stuck was of a slimy, spotted, grimacing grotesque, its mouth wide open, thick blue lips bleeding from a catfish hook. Local reporter Joe Mosby recalls the hype of headlines like, Mysterious Creature in Lake Conway, Target of Two Bullets by Fishermen, uh, from a late April 11th, 1953. Seems Carpenter Peter Riffle saw a head breach in some brush with no eyes, no ears, no hair, only dark brown frog-like skin. So he took aim with his 32 and fired twice. A few months later, the cabin claimed, Lake Monster Swallows Boys Rod Real Line. Supposedly, 13-year-old Donald McDonald hooked <laughs> the thing at Brandon's Landing and it swam off with his pole. Of course, all this was happening on the outskirts of Little Rock at a time when the front pages screamed, Negroes this, Negroes that, desegregation imminent. Meanwhile, the cabin's publisher, Frank Robbins Jr., came barging into the newsroom booming, no more monster stories unless there's a photograph. <laughs> So that was that, until sightings in the 70s. Same slick thing, same slimy skin, hissing at fishermen. But in 1980, the monster became a common Bigfoot. When a prominent citizen and son went fishing in the southeast corner of the lake, then saw it emerge, all eight-faced and seven feet tall. 
That was around the time relatives of Pastor Roy Mack skinned a calf and sewed its hide to a huge ass snapping turtle and released it to the lily pads. According to Mack's 2009 Pinecrest Baptist Church blog, the turtle crawled up on half-sunken logs and swam by other fishermen, thereby leading to bait shop gossip of a shaggy swimming southern Sasquatch. Even today, old timers remember something strange about a turtle, plus a character named Misto Griffin, who might have had a hand in this. Then in 1995, according to uh, James, uh, W.C. Jameson's Ozark Tales, an angler was attacked by a face and head straight from the depths of hell. Numerous theories abound. A rogue bear, an extremely gonzo gator gar, an escaped convict on the lam. Recently, though, there's been a new development. According to Jameson, who interviewed anglers for, the, for his chapter on the monster, then told me this in an email. I visited with two longtime Conwegians who confessed to me they made up the story in an attempt to frighten a certain population away. So there's your picture, Mr. Newspaper Publisher, demanded back in 53, African Americans fishing in Arkansas, USA, where the damn black waters of the damn back waters refract back the waves of ourself. Um, another cryptozoological phenomenon I studied was the supposed white mo river monster, which brought a media storm of activity and attention to the impoverished, disaster-stricken Newport Batesville area during the Great Depression, and seems to have more to do with putting on a show to bring in income to a suffering economy than actually celebrating any legendary monster in our midst. I also investigated the mythic Heber Springs water panther, which has been reported to be everything from an aggressive half Bigfoot, half panther, to a razorback wildcat, to a sensational supersized serpent. My biggest discovery regarding this creature, though, is that Judeo-Christian settlers were actually plagiarizing or recycling a story that originated with northern Native American tribes like the Chippewa, who traded with the Osage and other indigenous people in the area. The Lake Superior petroglyph here um, is, is many of these water panthers are depicted like this in um, cave drawings and, and stuff like that. Uh, it's no secret that there's a universal need for very different cultures to create similar creatures to explain things we have in common. Like when people or livestock disappear on or near water, we look for stories in other cultures to illuminate things in our own, and this, I believe, is how we create mythical beings and gods and God. I also did a, stu a study of catfish creatures in the Ozarks. There are stories that date back to the ancient people who lived here centuries before Anglo cultures came along and basically took the stories from the oral tradition and made them literal. In fact, a lot of the stories from this neck of the woods come from newspapers in the 1800s that recounted such tales. It could be argued, of course, that publishing stories about backwoods monsters back in the day may have been a form of pre-TV entertainment, or it could have also been a Fox News type of fear-mongering during a time when churches strove to civilize a rugged terrain filled with all sorts of ferocious beasts to which humans ascribe qualities of the devil. You know, the whole, ever since Adam and Eve got tossed out of paradise because they ate the apple morality story in which sinners cast out of paradise become out of grace homeless people. So please, kids, don't try this at home. <laughs> there he is. Yeah. Arca Squatch. <laughs> That's the uh, Boggy Creek monster there that uh, was the uh, subject of a film in the 1970s. There's another one out there. Um, the cryptozoological study that gave me the most guff, which actually directly relates to the whole wild man thing I've been investigating for almost 30 years, is the Sasquatch. 
which isn't so easy to just dismiss as some of the more fantastical creatures are in this book. Um, for example, we discover new kinds of primates every year. We once didn't believe that gorillas existed. And even Jane Goodall believes that Bigfoots are possible. Uh. <laughs> um, in a way, it takes a free thinker to consider that science can't disprove that Bigfoots exist because a lack of something is not evidence that something does in fact exist. My story about these critters is basically this. Like most people, I was skeptical of something so surreal being real. Because if they're really real, why don't we have any corpses or bones or credible photos or even DNA? So I kept an open mind, especially when interviewing the convinced. And the more I studied the possibility, the more I wanted to believe that there are eight foot parasuit goliaths running around all over the state and all over the world, just like wild men and wild women were once thought to rampage through the forests of ye old Europe. I mean, the idea is so fanciful and has so much character and it's always been that way, which is why the idea persists to this day. It's something we want to believe, basically, I think. To the point that following leads from the Arkansas expert on these supposed creatures, a retired detective whose pseudonym is Tal H. Branco, uh, down in Benton. I actually found myself lost in the Washita's and scrambling into the ferns. The sun was going down and I was in a panic, thinking that they were after me. Because that's what the imagination is capable of. We create incarnations of ourselves, and sometimes we fear these creations more than our actual selves. But I won't say that there is no logical explanation for the monsters we muse into existence. Because there is always a logical explanation, which is what this book is all about. Translate mean those unexplained moments into a portrait that's comprehensive or based on what we know. But with no intention of shooting down our childlike wonder that celebrates our urge to monstrify the commonplace. Which is a valuable defense mechanism for being human. <laughs> We create to, among other things, ward off angst and ennui. Because who wants to be practical? Practical's boring. It's a double-edged sword, though. Imagining forth such characters has its pros and cons. One of those cons being, sometimes we come up with bullshit, then convince others that bullshit is for real. Take our national discussion of weapons of mass destruction, for instance, which we had back in 2003. The consequence being the Iraq War, with over 500,000 people killed since the US-led invasion. <coughs> this monster, of course, was built on made-up information. Thus, the traditional, even cliche, recurring question of who or what are the real monsters in our midst. It's a question that's been around as long as literature itself, and is predated by cave drawings going back millennia. So um, basically, that's the talk, and I'm, I'm, I can answer questions if anybody's got questions and answers. Sure. Um, the question is, is, is regarding a, a podcast called Monster Talk. I have not heard that one. Um, no, I um, I did a lot of research on these monsters, monsters, creatures, whatever they are, um, and I published this book last year. Um, but I'll look for that podcast. Thank you for pointing that out. Oh. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Yeah. You heard anything about the salt monster and sounds like that and so 
Yeah, yeah, Bach monster, um, or if this is the Boggy Creek monster, uh, basically uh, it's interchangeable. Um, there has been hundreds of reports uh, from that area, Bog, Bog area. Uh, this guy here is probably got some relative down there. <laughs> um, these, the, these legends, these stories, they, they come from all over the world. I mean, it, almost every culture in existence has a story about some shaggy man, ape, beast thing. Um, but like I said, I, I think that uh, we invent these uh, characters um, for other reasons. <laughs> We, we do have, um, there are pla uh, plaster casts of footprints, though, Bigfoots. Um, yeah. And those are, that's some of the most convincing evidence, or I don't know if it's evidence or uh, something to talk about. Um, but uh, still, we're still looking for the proof. <laughs> uh, maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. So have you ran across any mythologies that directly associate alligator crawling? Uh, geez. Um, no, I mean, I could. No, I haven't. The stuff I've run across about alligator gar is all pretty much 20th century. Um, and, uh, um, but, you know, basically what happened with alligator gar is. Um, Settlers settled, settled the country, and um, there were these giant fish swimming around in the bayous and the swamps and the rivers, eight, ten feet long. They were really scary looking. People became afraid of them. They, they were immediately labeled devil fish, you know, uh, names like that, uh, associations with Satan. Um, and um, but the cultures here, um, at the same time that we were driving the Native Americans into the swamps, we were basically driving the alligator gar into the swamps too, um, decreasing their habitat, um, draining the swamps to create ir irrigation systems um, for agriculture, and um, and we began a culture of, of just uh, really demonizing these fish, um, uh, wiping them out when they were caught, Fathers taught their sons to kill them, leave them on the shore, leave them at the boat ramps. Um, and so uh, that's what's been going on with the alligator gar. They, they really considered a, a monster fish. But they are, the thing is, um, we, by wiping out all those alligator gars, we wiped them out in the 50s. We basically extirpated them from the state and our fisheries have been suffering for over 60 years because we need those big fish in the mix to eat the, the big um, the big minnows like um, buffalo and carp and uh, drum and stuff like that, which are actually the fish that do more damage to game fish populations than any other fish. Um, the, the alligator gar are the only fish out there that can eat can eat these big fish. They're also the only uh, fish out there that can eat the invasive snakeheads. Um, so wiping out monsters doesn't always help our environment. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Other questions? Yep. Uh, what would you say Arkansas's monster story most prominent one right now? This probably this guy here, the uh, Falk monster. Yeah, he's our he's our big monster. He he brought us a lot of uh, attention back in the well back in the seventies. Um, but the White River monster is also something to think about. I'm I, I'm going to read the poem about the White River monster. White River Monster Mania. The hysteria kicked in in 37, six miles south of Newport, when, quote, Negro 
tenant sharecropper Sylvia Wyatt went running to farmer Bramlett Bateman screaming that she'd seen a whale in the river. The next thing you know, CBS and the London Times were reporting on the bubble-blowing behemoth of Blue Hole. For two bits each, the masses were admitted to hot dog stands and carnival rides, monster burgers, and monster dance with orchestra orchestrated by Bateman and the Chamber of Commerce. Three witnesses signed swarm affidavits stating they'd seen a leviathan rising as big as a boxcar, like a slimy elephant without any legs. <laughs> For the next few weeks, there were newsreel cameramen, reporters from all over, and thousands of tourists and picnickers from as far away as California watching blow-by-blow -blow loudspeaker accounts broadcast on radio of Memphis diver Charlie Brown fighting Whitey with a harpoon. Supposedly, the sightings go back to a Quapaw grave whose canoe got rammed centuries back, though no more, no, though no lore in print before 37. <laughs> then came rumors of a Confederate gunboat sunken by a monster as well. In 1915, there were more reports, most notably from George Mann, who saw a crusty, gray-hided expanse of accursed flesh rise like a devil fish. A vision repeated in 24 by Ethel Smith of Little Rock, who watched something breach with a terrible blowing noise. But back to Bateman Bend in 37. It was the summer of 100 sightings and armed men patrolling the shores with live sticks of dynamite. As the festivities continued through July, as binocular rental services surged, as t-shirts and sidewalk sales brought the bling to town, Deputy Reed claimed to see the monster's jumbo catfish head, while toll bridge collector W.E. Penix constructed a mongo hempen net, but gave up when donations quit. In the meantime, Charlie Brown dove for days, and so did pearl diver David Smith with a helmet made from a Model T gas tank, a rubber hose, and a bicycle pump. <laughs> Then nothing until 1966, when Mary Skinner, Dorothy Day, and Vernon Tucker spotted a creature with a mermaid tail and a monkey head. <laughs> Five years later in 71, after subsequent sightings of the Falk monster exploding out of Texarkana, a new wave of publicity hit. Campers alleged a serpentine denizen shrieking like a half-horse cow. E. Dex described a thousand-pound unicorn whale. Ollie Richardson and grandson were born upon a blistered back. Sheriff Henderson of Jackson County found three toed tracks on Towhead Island. And Cloyce Warren photographed a widely published blur. Leading to the legislature passing a law in 73, designating the stretch from Jackson Port to Possum Grape, the White River Monster Refuge, <laughs> where it is now unlawful to kill, molest, trample, or harm the source of so many bumper stickers. <laughs> it should be noted, though, that scientists suspect an elephant seal swam up from the Gulf of Mexico, that the Associated Press reported an 11-foot alligator gar caught downriver in 1940, and that two beached bull sharks were found near Newport in 1980. The son of a legendary snapping turtle caught in 1893 was also a possibility, according to Aunt Lizzie Simmons. There's also a popular rumor of an old boy shell diver rigging up a sunken scow with lines that made the hull rise to scare the clammy competition away. The most convincing perspective, however, as to why this river monster is a croc was posited by Dale Cox. Bateman's description was very similar to the one reported around the world four years earlier during the first major blast of coverage of Scotland's Loch Ness Monster. Cox added that in the spring of 1937, Newport and much of the White River Valley had been devastated by one of the worst floods in Arkansas history, such that conditions were ripe for a publicity stunt that would bring visitors and desperately needed cash, meaning that whether or not this thing exists there's no denying the fact that the Newport Chamber of Com Commerce staged a form of theater, which continues to this day, an effigy of Whitey 
leading the annual Christmas Day Parade. So those are the sort of stories, poems, research in this book. Um, there's the Lake Conway monster, the White River monster, the Green Gaurau, there's the Water Panther, there's Catfish Creatures of the Ozarks, and then uh, the brunt of the book is devoted to our friend here, the Argus Squatch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Any other questions that I can I can address? Well, um, yeah, there's one. Well, you know, basically a wampus cat is, is an oversized panther -y thing. And it can be any size. There's so many types of wampus cats, supposedly. Like, there's the side hill wampus cat that has longer legs on one side of its body because it's always walking on the side of a hill. <laughs> there's the wampus cat that's, um, that the Conway High School uh, has as its mascot, which supposedly has uh, six arms. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's just so many different types of wampus cats uh, in, our, in our history. Um, it, the, the wampus cat was an interesting study. Um, I really didn't get to, to do as much research on that as I wanted, um, but when I did investigate the Heber Springs water panther, where there is some overlap, um, I, uh, I contacted the uh, editor of the newspaper up there in uh, at Greer's Ferry, Heber Springs, and um, um, I wanted to get some, you know, put on a call to local residents to give me any information they had on um, Heber Springs water panther. I, I did get, um, so they said, okay, if you write an article for our newspaper, we'll publish it. I, pu I wrote an article, they published it, I got a, a call from one guy up there who, who says that there's this black panther that, that keeps crossing his yard. Um, black panthers are, 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 are a popular kind of wampus cat, not just here in Arkansas, but all over the world um, there's black panthers that have been reported, I mean, especially in Europe too. Um, we had a, a, a few years ago in Arkansas a supposed black panther running around, and, and there was pictures in a paper or something. And um, Arkansas Game and Fish went out to investigate, and they found out it was it was a house cat. <laughs> <laughs> so so sometimes we see these things, and we want to think that they're what we want them to be, but maybe not so much. <laughs> Other questions, comments? Well, probably that's a good time to shut things down here. And you know, we got ten minutes to the next speaker, and I guess I'll be signing books out there. And thank you for listening, and thank you for coming, Arkansas Free Thinkers. <laughs>